Welcome to Resiliency Within. This is your host, Elaine miller Karras. My show today is entitled The Legacy of Civil Rights Leader, Medgar Evers, His Daughter Speaks. So my guest today is Rena Evers Everett. She is the daughter of civil rights activists, Medgar Evers and Marilee Evers Williams. And before formally introducing Rena, I wanna share some history. Her father was a civil rights activist and the first state field secretary of the NAACP in Mississippi. He was committed and a passionate organizer of voter registration efforts and economic boycotts and in investigated crimes perpetrated against black people. His wife, Marilee Evers, worked alongside him while they raised their family together in Jackson, Mississippi. Tragically, Medgar Evers was assassinated outside their Mississippi home in 1963. And after years of legal struggles, his killer was finally brought to justice and imprisoned in 1994. Rena's mother, Marilee Evers Williams, has been a moving force in the civil rights movement and carried on her husband's legacy. And from 1995 to 1998, she was the first woman to head the NAACP full time. And in 1989, she founded the Medgar Evers Institute with the initial goal of preserving and advancing the legacy of Medgar Evers' life's work. And recognizing the international leadership role that she played, the Institute's board of directors changed the organization's name to Medgar and Marilee Evers Institute. And Rena Evers carries on in her parents' footsteps. And boy, she's making her own footsteps as well, I have to say. And since 2012, she has been the executive director of the Medgar and Marilee Evers Institute. She has lectured nationally about youth awareness and involvement, consulted on training youth activists, and coordinated with the U.S. Department of the Interior um, to make the Evers House in Mississippi a national monument which I think just recently happened. We'll ask her more about it when, she's, when she starts to speak. But she's also shared with me that she was inspired and humbled by her father's courageous leadership and integrity. And boy, do we need that to, to be reminded of that right now in America. She continues to seek avenues to advance the mission of cultivating positive social change, intergenerational civic engagement and justice through research on equity and social justice worldwide. I have to say that we've had many email exchanges because we're working on the project together as well. And I've noticed on her signature that she, of her email, that she has a quote and it, and it says, although great strides in the field of human relations have been made, we cannot let up now, which her dad stated in 1961. And boy, it could not be more true in 2021. I have really been fortunate, Rena, to know you over, over a number of years, and it's my honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Rena Evers Everett. Thank you so much, Elaine. You know it's a joy and just a delight to be with you anywhere and to just uh, spend time with you. Well, we've never had a short a shortage of things uh, in terms of when we start to talk. It seems like we it never ends. So, we've actually we've prepared today some questions. And but before we we get started, I I want to ask you this: What you know, as as we get started, what is on your mind and in your heart today? Today, my heart is um, is a little heavy. It's it's heavy because. Uh, in recent days, we have had the, <laughs> the decision made that um, one of our highest officials in the land uh, will not um, be tried for uh, the type of domestic terrorist things that that he invoked yes and um and so it's it's a it's a sense of heaviness only because it feels like i'm back in the 60s again where uh we know the tragedies but then we stop we turn and it's it's forgotten or or swept under the rug and so 
but I have hope. I always have hope. So can you tell me more about that hope? Because I think it has been a difficult time for many Americans over the last, well, few years, to say the least. And to see that, um, that someone who we, who many of us believe, I think on both sides of the aisle, incited a, um, a mob to really uh, almost tear down our democracy, um, jolted many of us. So when you say we have hope, can you tell us a little bit about that hope? We have, I have hope because of going through instances just like this in my lifetime and um, in my parents' lifetime and starting 400 plus years ago uh, with slavery on, on several continents, but coming to this continent and um, the br brutal acknowledgement of a, a race not being human and treated not in a humane way continues yes. at different levels. We've, we've uh, and, and sometimes I hate to say the word, but we've overcome some things, but we, we still have so much more to do. So much more to do. Yeah. And, but it, the hope comes in because people in general, but especially the African-American, the Brown, uh, the, the Asian, when you have so much despair put upon you and you continue to step, step by step forward and strive and thrive, there's hope there. That this I think you, you and I were talking about this um, ancestral resiliency. So mm -hmm. in spite of all these things that have happened, um, to people of color and people who've come to this country from many different places on, on the globe, there has been this amazing stick to -ness. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you see that ans ancestral resiliency? Well, the resiliency is, is the respect of oneself inside to, to continue to stand tall even if you're knocked down. So I think of resiliency almost as like a rubber band, huh. stretched yeah. and stretched to almost a breaking point. But even if it's at a breaking point, those pieces that are broken still snap back into a form that can still move and do something that's going to strengthen where it stands or what it holds. And that's how I see the African-American race. That's how I see all races, but, the, but the, the parts that are not shown as equal, it just, um, we always pop back. Yes. But we pop back and we get stronger and stronger. Well, and as you say that stronger and stronger, and I've been reading a lot about your dad and just, oh my goodness, he was so eloquent in his writings. Um, we were talking, I was reading about him oh, being that. <laughs> that he was very charismatic, <laughs> that he had a great sense of humor. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about was some of your memories, your fond memories about your dad, because one of the things that the quotes that I read uh, I'm going to paraphrase it, but he said, I, he loved his family so much and that even if he would lose his life, if it would mean a better future for his children, he would right. gladly give up his life. And I just thought, wow, this is some man who uh, yeah. I guess was somewhat prophetic too, because I, you shared with me when he made that statement. If, so let's know, could, let, let me know about the memories and maybe you can tell us more about that quote. Well, um, let me give you some wonderful memories of my dad. Uh, I was eight and a half. And I say that half for some reason where I'm so proud that I got to eight and a half because I had six more months of being with him um, when he was, was killed um, on, on our carport. Um, he was very charismatic. 
Uh, and it's, it's funny because he has a wonderful smile um, and a wonderful laugh. And he was a jokester. He used to joke all the time and, and do things to, you know, frighten my mother and, and <laughs> play with us. And um, one thing that I just, I love about my dad is that yes, he was gone and we knew he was gone. And he would tell us that he's gonna be away, but that he always loved us. And he called us constantly to remind us what to do, but that he always loved us. So we never ever felt like he was gone too far and that we did not, we weren't able to touch him and know that he loved us. So he was but always quality, present. The always present. Was present, yes, always. The quality was present. And when he came home, um, you know, he did things with us, uh, like <laughs> always playing with the neighborhood kids. The neighborhood kids loved him. He was like the Pied Piper as soon as he came home. Mr. Evers, Mr. Evers, come out and play, come out and play. <laughs> and he would with the whole neighborhood. And, um, and then he would, you know, come in and put on the records and play with us. So, and um, one of my favorite things is dancing with my dad. Well, there's, was there music that you love to, to uh, uh, dance to? Chubby Checker. Chubby Checker. Yes. So, of course, I know. Some of those who might remember that twist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we're, we're contemporaries in terms of age. So, yes, that was a very popular thing when we were little girls. Right, <laughs> yes, right, little girls. right, right. But um, he always instilled... Um, wisdom and we didn't know all that at, at that time but he was a, a man who was strong on strategy he was he was passionate on his beliefs as you you know and um he was always active in trying to get it done and making sure that equality and empowerment among all and equity was was up front and uh in making sure that that it was for all people. Now, um, can I ask you something too? Because mm -hmm. um, you also shared a lot about your mom, and they oh. were a partnership. And they, I know that your mom lives out in Southern California. She does. And, uh, can you tell us maybe some memories of the two of them together with your family? Well, um, <laughs> mom, even though dad was a disciplinarian, she she was a disciplinarian first, and so she. she <laughs> not hesitate to say, um, you know, go and get the, the switch. And then she would say, just wait till your father gets home. So we got double whammied. But um, my mother worked alongside of my father from the very beginning when they got married or actually before they got married when they, they were at Alcorn A&M um, and worked up in Mount Bayou with Dr. T.R.M. Howard, uh, a fantastic civil rights activist in his own right, um, and continued until um, I think we got in grade school working with my father and um, still did his speeches, edited and, and um, produced all of the paperwork and phone calls and everything and was, you know, in meetings, uh, especially meetings at our home, uh, people who come far and wide that I didn't know the notoriety of them until later. Uh, but Dr. King came, uh, James Baldwin came, um, uh, uh, Harry Belafonte, Lena Horne came down to do a benefit uh, to, to help out voters registration. And I, and I also recall you saying that these folks also surrounded you yeah. after his death, that there was a great pouring out to you and your family. And, you know, we talked about, um, as we were getting ready for the show, that I really wanted to give you space to share as little or as much as you wanted about that night and what happened and what you remember. So that's the invitation to you. Rena, and you know that I'm right here with you, even though we're across the country holding your hand. Well, I tell you, I tell you, Elaine, one of the best things uh, about knowing you 
is to come into your space, whether we're physically there or not, and understanding that you're going to take your responsibility of such a beautiful healthcare practitioner and ground us. And so um, I ask you to do that. Yes. And you know, we call them resilient pauses. And, and sometimes if the story feels like it's getting a little bit too much, we'll just take a pause and then you can continue anywhere you want to go. To go. All right. So I'm right here with you. Okay. Well, um, June 12th, 1963, um, my father kind of stayed home a little longer than he normally did. And it kept on telling us how much he loved us and, and talked about things and told my eldest brother, Daryl Kenyatta, you know, you're the man of the house and all that. Uh, we've always been getting um, phone calls and phone calls were not always pleasant. A lot of times they were the threatening phone calls. And um, I used to pick up the phone. Um, my brother used to pick up the phone until we got a lot of calls that would, the caller would tell us how they would kill my father and kill us. And um, so that day we got some, um, my mother picked it up, but uh, my father wanted us to come to a mass meeting that evening. And we were happy as kids because we got to go and be with the grownups late at night. Um, he brought us in and um, loved on us and hugged us before he had to go up and, and speak. And uh, it was that night that he um, repeated saying that he, he would uh, die and die gladly if it made it a better world for his wife and his children and all children. And um, so he told us we could stay up that night um, because uh, we could stay up until he got home. And uh, so we stayed up to watch President Kennedy's speech and talk about the uh, sons and daughters of slaves and how they are still not free. Um, and then when we heard my father's car come in. So you were um, actually awake because they gave you permission yeah. to stay up later. So that's, right. yes, okay. We were up and we were actually watching The Untouchables with Elliot Ness. Okay. Um, and for those of you who don't know The Untouchables, it's a gangster show. It's a, it's a gangster. <laughs> but, you know, I, can I just ask you one question? Can you remember when you were at that meeting earlier in the evening when he loved on you? Can mm -hmm. you remember? I feel it. Can you feel I it? I feel it. And, and that's, you know, one of the, you, you talked about, resiliency and, and we've talked about what helps us and, and, and knowing that my father's love is always surrounding me. Mm -hmm. helps me. So I'm just going to invite you to notice that, you know, I always say those questions, right? To notice those sensations. You got a big smile on your face if our <laughs> listeners could see you. Yeah. But anyway, just remember that right now as we go into the yeah. next part, because I know this is a hard part, the next part. Uh, it is, and and um, it's it's one that doesn't go away. Uh, trauma, trauma, uh, violent trauma, any trauma, but violent trauma doesn't leave you. Um, it's never left me, and it comes back uh, repeatedly. Uh, it's it's um, it's fresh. So it can be, and there can be these reminders, these triggers that bring us back into those. Because I know that when we, we, we talked after the death of George Floyd, I called you and I said, how are you doing, my friend? Knowing that that could possibly trigger everything all over again, because that's and how we did. are as human beings. Yeah. And it did. So, I mean, this whole year, years, but especially this last 18 months just was, um, unbearable yeah unbearable in the sense that that so many people fought and died for this not to happen right and we are in another generation that is going through the same thing right. and so seeing um george floyd being 
pushed to his death. Yes. Um, it brought back that night. Hit me hard simply because uh, that night um, my father drove up, got out on the driver's side and he agreed with my mom to get out on the, the passenger side because it's safer. Um, and they, he got, the assassin got him. And it just, it still amazes me because my father was a, uh, a, not a real big man, but he was, you know, almost six feet. And, but he was, he was ath an athlete. And so he was he strong, could be strong. A, a bodybuilder. So he was very strong and he pulled himself with white t-shirts that had black writing and said, Jim Crow must go. And he had it mm -hmm. in his arm, which was so um, hard to deal with because when my mother ran out, we heard the shots go off. Mm -hmm. And my father had, had done a game with us. And the game is to understand what the difference is between a, a car backfiring, a gunshot, where's the safest place in the house? Because we had already gotten a firebomb thrown in our home. We'd already had So he actually, part of his loving of you was really preparing you right. for these things that he knew could have happened to right. your family. Yes. Right. And so we did what, Daryl and I did what, what my father trained us to do. We thought it was a game, but we knew mm -hmm. that when that happened. And so we, my mother did not, she got up and ran and, and shots ran out. So it really wasn't just to get my father, it was to get the rest of us. And, um, but they got him and she screamed. Daryl and I got Van into the tub where where Van would be my youngest brother. Yes. He was three at the time. Um, and um, then we ran after mom and there was dad in his, in a big pool of his blood. And um, we went down to him yelling, daddy, daddy, get up, daddy, daddy, get up. Um, but he blinked at us. He blinked at so, you. He blinked so at there us. was some, there was that Still the life in him to let yes. know that he had yeah. heard you. Yes. Right. He blinked at us. And uh, then um, he was uh, taken uh, on my mattress. <laughs> on your to, mattress in the ambulance? No. A car. Ambulance did not come. Police did not come. No one that came. Was that was, and I hope it's not still, but that's the way it was. I mean, they were all, most of them were all in on it. So it was the, our wonderful neighbors that uh, got him at this, got the station wagon and took him to the hospital. And um, they turned him away at first because he African-American. And then um, they found out who he was. Um, and one doctor just said no and took him in and tried to, uh, tried to save him. him. Yeah. Right. But it was a humongous hole through his back. To me. So there was, no, there was no way for him to recover from that injury. Yeah. So, you know, Rena, when, you, when I think about you just being such a small little girl and going through such a horrific thing, seeing this beloved man that you've told us a little bit about his humor, his charisma and his love for your family. So, you know, how do you heal from, from this? I mean, what gets you through this kind of experience? You know, um, my faith, um, the love of, of my mom and my family, uh, my, my children now, uh, but it, it's, you know, I told my mother uh, a couple of days after my father passed that um, daddy was so tired, mommy, he mm. needed rest. Daddy was so tired, he needed a rest. Yeah, and I had no idea. I think about it now. I don't know why that came out of my mouth, but I knew that he was tired and uh, that he needed rest. So it's like, 
um, God just had that on me. And, uh, and I just, I knew I wasn't going to be without him, but I was going to be without him. Yeah. So you, so, so even there is a little girl that you knew that his spirit and his, and his memory and his faith with your faith, that even though he wasn't going to be physically present with you, that he would be with you. You knew that at nine years old. Always, always, huh. always. My father has been with me and I know. Um, and can you just sense quickly, that? My father's been with me at every Three. birth, every yes. birth, my father. Every birth. So I'm just going to invite you because you know that's what I do. Can you sense that his <laughs> presence? I know. Look, and she's yeah. laughing. If you can see her, she has a big old no, smile just, on her I, face. I, I feel smile. him. I mean, he's behind smile. me right now. Yes, <laughs> she has a lovely photo of him. It looks like a beautiful ink drawing behind her, and I know that you wanted to say a little bit about it, but just it's important to sense him right now as you've just recounted this story. Yeah. He just, uh, this is actually a drawing by Nicholas Shaith, and um, he, it's not a drawing, it's, it's, it's gunpowder. Gunpowder, that's a my. Gunpowder, that's adhered to the canvas. It's just unbelievable, unbelievable. And, and at first I didn't want it because it was gunpowder, but yes, it's, it's just, it's phenomenal. And it's a reminder and um, it's a beautiful, beautiful likeness of it. Well, I want people to know that they can go to our Facebook page for Resiliency Within to see you and see the photo. And they can, after the show is over, they can go in and see the, the video as well. So it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture of your dad. We're getting ready. Um, we're going to be shortly going to our break. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for this heartfelt story of hearing not only about the tragedy of your dad's passing, but to hear about him and to hear about your mom and about their spirits and knowing that your mom's spirit also carried you across the country to uh, the city where I yeah, live. Yeah, we might we, talk about that. Yeah, we'll have to talk <laughs> about that too. So, um, which is of course where we met here and, um, yeah. and we'll talk more about that. But I, I just wanna say, Rena, thank you so much for sharing that with us so that people know not only the tragedy and the horror of it, but also how you continue and you have such a spirit of healing and resiliency. It's like you can touch the suffering and also touch what else is true, which is that hope. And I know the, the courage that you have to go forward. And when we come back from the break, uh, and this is to remind you all that we're um, you're here with Elaine Miller Karras, the host of the show, and Rena Evers Everett. She's going to tell us a little bit about what she's been doing, which is a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> we come back from the break with the with the institute, and also tell you about an amazing documentary called Evers that will be coming out soon. So please stay tuned, and when we come back, we will hear more from Rena Evers Everett as she tells us the footsteps, the pretty big ones that she's making yeah. in the world. Thank you, Rena. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. All right, awesome job. We're all clear. Back in a couple minutes. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. We have a couple minutes and we're still on Facebook. So if there's anything that you want to say, Rena, about anything right now, as we have a couple minutes to talk to our Facebook folks. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I know this is kind of, this is a show that's really going down memory lane, but it's important that we know our memories, that we, we don't always run away from them. Uh, we need to understand how important it is that our memories shape us. Uh, and it's hard. It's um, the story that was told was, it, it lives within me always. And it is not uh, an easy task uh, to, to keep that memory um, contained where it won't do damage. And we all have challenges. We all, some have so much more than others, but we all have challenges. And uh, I just want you to keep living, keep wanting to live. Um, 
I don't know what time we have, but I wanted to share this one poem and I don't know if you- Well, you know, we can have, I would, I'd love for you to share it, but I think it'd be nice for you to share it when we're- um, With everybody. When we come back. Yeah, we'll have time for you to do that. But I think that poem, we can start that as soon as you get back, you can say, I'll say, say that you want to share a poem and you can do that. <laughs> But, you know, I think, Rena, too, that, you know, you're inspiring to me because I know you've been through a heck of a lot in your life as well, not only mm -hmm. um, with your dad's passing, but with other challenges that you've had. And and you do have this kind of indomitable spirit of keeping going mm -hmm. and knowing that the work is not done. Yeah, um, right. And so I think that if your dad, I can, you know, the way you describe him, if he was sitting right here with us, he would be so proud of you. Oh, thank you. I do think he I, You know, I, um, you talked about footsteps. That's some large footsteps. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. So glad to come in too. But uh, I, I know you have some wonderful ideas um, that you're going to share when we get, when we come back on um, online again. And that will be wonderful to hear because i mean you're leading those those footsteps now your mom still has a pretty year i know she's your oh, big, big advisor has, <laughs> yes she has a pretty <laughs> step out there yes that those those won't leave anytime soon so is it is it nice to be able to know that you can talk to her when oh there's like challenges that happen within the institute that you can go mom <laughs> did you have to go through this <laughs> uh, no we'll uh, see What's interesting. Sorry to interrupt, but we are coming back in about 10 seconds. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. You want me to wait? I can wait. Yeah. We'll hear the music again. This is Resiliency Within with Elaine Miller Karras. To reach the show during our live broadcast, please call in to 1 866 472 5792. That's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email to elaine at resiliencywithin.com. Now, back to this week's show. Welcome back. This is Elaine miller Karras back talking to Rena Evers Everett. And we're having a wonderful discussion about her memories of her, of her dad and her, of course, living memories of her mom right now. She lives in Southern California. And as we were talking um, during the break, she remembered that she had a poem that she wanted to share. So, uh, Rena, I'm going to invite you to share that poem with us before we talk a little bit more about some of the work that you've been doing. Well, I tell you, Elaine, thank you. Um, it's, it's just one of several poems that um, or sayings that have just resonated with me. And um, they're not super famous but they resonate and that's, that's one thing that I have learned. You asked me what, what gives me hope. I've learned to, to listen to the, the spirit from within. And my mother said that at uh, the second inaugural speech, it's listen to the, the spirit that's within and resonate with what is, is it telling you to do. And so this, it's a cute little uh, poem that says life is short live it. Love is rare. Grab it. Anger is bad. Dump it. <laughs> Fear is awful. Face it. Memories are sweet. Cherish it. And um, it's, it's just a cute little poem, but it says so much for all of the different areas of your life, but especially of mine. At times when I feel low, at times when I'm angry, I'm like, okay, I need to just dump this out the way. And times that the fear factor comes back into play, whether it's with the job, whether it's with relationships, whether it's with just life in general. And, you know, you just have to face it. And one thing that resonates with me with that is that my father faced it. Yeah, all the time. And to me, it's just amazing being back in Jackson, Mississippi. Didn't think I would ever do that. Uh, didn't want to because it's such a bittersweet memory. 
and uh, I'm back here because yet you were propelled to, really to go yeah, forward. Exactly. This was the work that you had you right. were called to do, which is really brings me to my next question, which is how has your lived experience inspired you to create the work you are passionate about now? So tell us a little bit about what well, you're what you're doing in the world. I tell you, um, just just a little quick background on on my mother brought us to California after a year after my father uh, was killed because she couldn't take any more of the threats. And even though California, we encountered the same thing, uh, not a, not as intense, but it did happen. So. During that time, my, my eldest brother and I, Daryl, uh, kept on saying, we just wanted to be normal. You know, we wanted to be normal. Well, what's normal? Yeah, I was going to say, what is normal? <laughs> what was that like? <laughs> you know, and, and, and in our eyes, we wanted both parents. And we wanted my mother not to be working like she was working, not to be gone, not to also get the threats. That's what we, we thought was normal not to have all those negatives, right? And, um, but then to watch her and to be alongside my mother when she was doing what she was doing, carrying on what my father had started, trying to make sure that his legacy was, was solid amongst all and understand the characteristics and the a purpose-driven life that he had. And then making her own. I mean, truly making her own in, in Congress, running for Congress, uh, being one of the first uh, women in, um, on the board commissioners in Los Angeles. She did a lot in corporate life. And so watching her go through her new lifestyle, um, I was kind of on the fringes of it. But so I absorb part of that, you know, and like, oh, wow, it's great to do things. It's great to go out and march. It's great to go ahead and say that we're fighting for equality and doing something about it and making sure our voices are heard. Well, if you were on the fringes, you certainly have taken it and embraced it in your life in the present moment. So you well, were listening. Um, you were listening. So uh, I was listening, but I didn't want to go down the same path my parents did. I didn't. I, I that, that's where the fear came in. That's where the fear came. So in. what, what switched, what switched to, to say, well, okay, I'll go I, back I, to Jackson. I had my children, my children got grown and I said, okay, I had gone through a divorce and I'm like, I have to live my life. And the South was calling me back. And I didn't initially go to Mississippi. My mother came back and went to Alcorn as a visiting professor. And because I was close, I was in Georgia. She goes, come over and help me. <laughs> so, I wonder if there was an ulterior motive there that she yes, I came over to help her or you'd have to stay there. And, well, that, you know, I found that out a month yeah. after I went yeah. to help her. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I just felt like I was home and that I needed to continue on the path because things were still not at the place that I thought they should have been by then. Um, but I wasn't looking for a political office. I, I'm a grassroots, let me go behind the desk, let me go ahead and get the, the ballots out, let me tell you, let me help you how to do that, understand what your rights are, you know. But and it so, sounds to me like you've been talking about the spirit of your dad. There might have been some nudging from from <laughs> beyond saying, well, you might like to be the grassroots person behind the scenes, but we're going to push you to the front. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and you and you have been in there too. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, um, and, you know, I think it's, you know, this is Black History Month. I think it should be every month. Mm -hmm. But I know that part of your, yeah. what the legacy is, is wanting to speak the truth and wanting to make sure that the truth is known, not just by uh, a certain segment of society, but all of society. Oh. And I know that's one of your heartfelt missions. I think we share that mission. And uh, can you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what you do yeah. through the MMEI that I'm just going to 
shorten the name for the Institute because it's a long name to say every single it's time. <laughs> yes, M -M -E And we call yes. it MMEI all the time. Yes. Um, but we, we really focus on, on youth leadership development, but intergenerational connectivity and exchange of knowledge uh, because it's not just it's, it's not just one voice that you need to understand and learn from. We need to in, incorporate all voices, but focus on, on my, my real joy in life is focusing on the babies, okay? Uh, and I say the babies and I'm saying kindergarten up, but we started uh, with, with the help of the JSD Foundation, the A-Team and, and the A-Team uh, does learns about characteristics and the movement of my father, but we mentor. So we do their ment we do the mentoring program. But then we've gone on to say, hey, this in this day and time, everybody needs healing. Everybody needs to heal in some way. And, and this has been, as it's been said over and over again, an unprecedented time. We have violence that's that's global. We have uh, health uh, disparities that are global and a pandemic that's global. We all need healing. And so we've done a, uh, a project called a healing cafe, a virtual healing cafe, a seat at the table where we're looking at juniors and seniors of high school and saying, you know what? Everybody's in uh, a different norm right now. We want to know what you want in order to survive that norm. And so we're doing that project along with um, Trauma Resource Institute has come and helped us with putting that all together. And then we're moving on to a larger project because we want to understand what happened in the 40s, 50s, and 60s that gave people like my father, John Lewis, and, and so many others the courage to do what they did. And so we're doing a Steps in Courage program. And part yeah. of the mission I understand is like, you really wanna empower young people yes. to learn about these stories, to really encourage their advocacy in the present moment. Exactly. That can you say a little bit more? I, get, I got so excited when you first told me about this, this potential project. Well, um, it, it's, it's kind of three, it, it comes in three sections, but they all intertwine. And it's really about um, understanding the, the democracy process, understanding that you have a voice that you need to empower in order to move the, everybody forward in generations. But we're doing that by also giving you, giving everyone true stories of the, of the civil rights movement initially, but then it's gonna be historical stories. So we're talking to veterans of the movement, but people who don't, you don't even know that have helped you know, a family survive uh, um, their burning of a home or helped, you know, raise up the church when it was burned down or helped with, with jail if you've been jailed. You know, we're getting those stories from family members that are coming out and said, I was with your father. I did this. You know, I was, uh, you know, 13 years old and I marched with him. And, and so getting to those people, hearing their stories, and what really propelled me was understanding that when my children were going through school, what they had in their textbooks were only two paragraphs about the civil rights movement. And if they had my father in there at all, it was basically one to two sentences. And the sentence was June 12th, 1963, civil rights leader Medgar Evers was assassinated by a white supremacist. And that's, that's it. They and don't so, And that's what's so important, Rena, as we've spoken about this, is that we wanna tell the, the living history. Right. Like when I ask you about your dad and what he was like, and there, I imagine there are a million stories about 
his advocacy for, for people that are still here with us, because we don't want to lose also some of that living experience because people who are were in that civil rights movement are getting older now. So we want to make sure we try to memorialize those stories as right. much as we can. Certainly, we can talk to people who knew them like we talk about your dad, but that's so important for us to really think about as a nation. Let's tell the true stories, not the stories that sometimes came from a, a, a certain perspective, and, and maybe I'm just going to say this from white advantage or privilege, mm -hmm. and didn't necessarily include the entire story. So that's the that's uh, the purpose of Steps and Courage. It is the purpose of really what we do at the Institute. But for that program, it is to really have it in the next level of engagement and interaction with technology. And so to and, bring and technology is so important right now because yeah. that's where, where the kids that's are, right? Yeah. Oh my well, God, my right four-year-old my four-year-old granddaughter and her iPad, we have to limit it because I mean, she <laughs> knows how to use that, that iPad and, and there's a certain seductiveness to it. So if we can somehow create that technology with the history, it yes. can be so active and an, an amazing way that could be integrated in every single school in the country and also spread out to the wider world. I think that's part well, that's, of the mission. That's our goal. Yes. That's our goal is, is, is not just to have it for educational institutions, but to have it worldwide for accessibility and uh, interactivity, but really to just understand where, where you came from and where you need to go. Well, there's, there was a, there's a question related to this that I think is really important that we talk about, and that's the importance of create, creating a dialogue between all people. Mm -hmm. um, we know that if we stay in our silos, we're not going to be communicating with one another and learning what we need to learn from each other so that we can change the divisiveness that I know that you and I have um, spoken about and been horrified by, and knowing that it's been there and some of us thought it was underneath the carpet or maybe that it even wasn't even there anymore. But, you know, you, you I think you said to me um, a couple of weeks ago, you know, there's people that think that everything got accomplished in the civil rights movement, Elaine. Yeah. And that, that hasn't happened, has it? No. no. So, but how can, you know, what can we do during, as you said, these unprecedented times when we've seen the amplification of racism in America um, and people being emboldened in ways that have been really frightening? For, for, for society. What are some of your ideas? How do we bring people together um, in your I, VISTA? I think the first thing that I would say is even if you're in your silo, start taking off those blinders. Start opening up your ears and just listening because if, you're, if you feel like you're fearful of what you might hear, you won't step out of that comfort zone to engage someone else's opinion. So first of all, you need to get to a place within yourself to know it's all right to step out and listen to someone else, look at someone else, say distance now <laughs> with mask, but- That's right. <laughs> I got that. New norm. Um, but to, to understand that we have to engage in order to learn about each other. We, uh, there's all type of programs, all type of welcome, welcoming um, circles that are out there. I'm just gonna go to the real basic. When you go out, whenever you go out, be honest with yourself. By when you look at someone that you don't know, that has a different culture, different ethnic background, different gender, different color, how do you truly feel within? And address that and see, is that, is that what you, is that how you want to be and want your, whether you have children or not, but the people that you care for, do you want them to carry on that feeling? And so many people lately have shown that they do in the most negative way. But I'm hoping to say, I'm hoping to see people say, you know, I bleed like you. I am human. 
Yeah. And um, what, what's important is, is to constantly hear the voices of all. So that we can have that, that common a dialogue. And I think the dialogues can be hard. And I, I want to just bring in a little bit of, of the Trauma Resource Institute here, because I think we are very dedicated with knowing that we have a common biology, all of us. Mm-hmm. When you say that we all bleed, we do have similar sensations when we experience fear. Mm-hmm. Um, we have similar sensations when we experience love or when you shared with us those memories of that, that love, being loved on by your dad um, and what that does to us on the inside when we remember those loving moments. And you know, one of the things that we've seen is that when we can learn to, what I say, read your nervous system, so right. that you can get into a state of more balance that sometimes that dialogue can occur because if we get bumped into states of extreme anger or so low and depressed that we can't even speak, then the dialogues don't happen in that way. And that's really how Rena and I, you and I really met was you coming to a training and learning about there may be some things to help with the fear. Didn't take it all away because fear is there for a purpose. We're designed to stay alive. And so there are darn good reasons to feel fearful right now when we've seen what's been happening in the country. And that's, we don't want to turn that, that fear response off. But at the same time, when we're in places where we feel safer, how do we turn the volume down on that fear? And I think that's what, you know, the, that aspect of healing that can be another way that we can learn to have times when we feel better inside of ourselves, even if that's in our house with all the doors locked and the windows closed and the shades drawn, but that's important for our well-being. It's kind of like putting an oxygen mask on when there hasn't been enough oxygen. But I think, you know, talking about the oxygen mask, uh, you know, when if, if you fly, uh, they go through the safety requirements and they tell you to put on your own oxygen mask first, right? Yes. What you just talked about. But then you go and you help the next person. Exactly. Put on that oxygen mask and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going. And, and it is just... One thing that keeps resonating with me all the time, and this was after the fire bombing at our home, and my father wasn't there, but uh, he he came back um, and he checked on all of us, of course. And um, he's I looked at him, and it was early, early, early in the morning, and I said, "Daddy, Daddy, do all white people hate us?" Mm-hmm. And it took him a, a while. And um, he called me by my, my nickname and he said, Sunshine, um, there's good and bad in everyone. Always look for the good. Hmm. And you just try to always look for that good, you know. Um, and this is not a Pollyanna thing. It's just that in your soul, in your spirit, there's good. There is good. And not every day, not every moment are you going to exude that. But if you could have that always in front of you to look for the good, I think, um, and, and to express that and to express it. And I think, Rena, you know, in terms of, my, you know, kind of my lived experience, sometimes that good can be shrouded. It's so covered up with so many layers that can be trauma, can be hatred, can be, for whatever reason, um, a perspective that got so ingrained in someone. Yeah. then that becomes the driver of your bus, right? So then mm-hmm. you see everything through that lens. Yeah. But I think what you just shared, and I think, you know, probably what brought us together is that we both believe in that goodness. And that if it's, if we can't see it, maybe we can help people see it in themselves. I hope so. Uh, and, I hope so. and when we have that's, though. That's what, our, that's what our drive is, Elaine. Is. That's what our drive is. <laughs> I know it is. It's, it's about the human race. It's about all of us. And, and we have to lift everyone up and get everyone to, to the highest level of, of equality as possible. So as we're, as we're, you know, I, I mean, this, t- boy, this hour has gone so fast with you. Yeah. My goodness. I, I knew that we would, once we started talking, we, <laughs> it would just, it would just go. But um, you know, as we're getting ready to close today, I'm just wondering if there's any parting words that you want to share 
with our listeners in terms of this kind of pathway of courage, advocacy, and healing mm. that you have so beautifully demonstrated, not only in yourself, but in sharing about your mom and your dad and, and the Institute. Is there anything, any parting words? Oh, I, I, I thank you for that, those kind words, but I tell you, um, there, there is one thing that I, I was thinking about before and, uh, what resonates always with me, and I have a plaque in my bedroom, so as soon as I wake up, I see it. Faith makes things possible, not easy. And um, I have to remember that all the time and um, call on our creator. But one thing that my father said to my mother the night before, uh, my mother said to him, I, I can't live without you. And he said to her, you're stronger than you think you are. You're stronger than you think you are. You're stronger so, than you think you are. So, so, so I say you have the courage to put one step ahead, one day at a time, because the will and resolve is inside of you to face and fight life's challenges. All right. So in our final 30 seconds we have left, can you tell people how to get in touch with you quickly? Uh, Eversinstitute.org. Yes. And um, you can do info at eversinstitute.org if you would like to email me. And um, that's the best way to contact us. I mean, there's- And also to, to hear about the Evers documentary as well. And, and the Evers okay. documentary is, is coming out soon on Amazon. Okay. And thank you so much, Rena. And I think you've reminded us, I always like to end- you know, she is a living example of what else is true after so much struggles and so much suffering and continuing to be such a positive light of goodness in the, on the planet. So thank you so much for being with us. And all I have to say, um, Rena, it's wonderful to be a collaborator with you and a wonderful to be your friend. I'm so excited about our path forward and always about being a friend and I thank everyone who's out there for just listening and moving forward in your own path of positive humanitarian ways. Thank you. And this is Elaine Miller Karras, Resiliency Within, signing off for the day. Thank you so much. All right, perfect. Good show. Nicely done, ladies. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Have a great week. I'll talk to you next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Rena. Um, you were wonderful. Our, our well, <laughs> listeners are still there. Oh my goodness, my friend. Thank I don't know about so that. For your it's, just, it's, a, it's a joy just talking with you. Um, there's so much to share and, 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 and the hour went by extremely fast. Oh my gosh. I was going, oh my gosh, we have 30 seconds left. How did I miss that? <laughs> and well, you, you, you willed in um, a lot. Um, I, I do appreciate talking about that night because it does help every little bit. It does. Uh, it brings the pain fast and forward, but then it, um, there's a soothing effect that's saying, but it's all right. It's yeah. all right. It's all right. So, well, I want so you to, to, to really, I'm going to invite you to notice that it's all right. Yeah. It's all right, my friend. It is. Yeah. it is. And so I hope for those that can still hear us, um, it's all right to breathe. It's all right to it's breathe. It's all right to breathe. Well, you know, Rena, I'm hoping, you know, I've got my 13 pilot uh, shows on um, this wonderful Voice wonderful. America. And we'll, and we'll see if we if we get renewed. I'm definitely having you back again. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, you should be renewed. You're doing we'll see. work for everyone. <laughs> we'll see. I'm trying to highlight the uh, the goodness in the world that's being spread yeah. when we have so much suffering and sadness. You know, it's yeah. part of my mission. So, but well, anyway, you bring light. You bring light. Well, thank you. Um, and back at you. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're trying to do together, too. That's what we're trying to do. To life. Yes, it's so true. Well, I know that we'll have more conversations in the coming weeks and 
thank you all of our Facebook uh, listeners. And if there were questions, we will try to get them answered and get the answers back to you. And you know how to get a hold of Rena, and you definitely know how to get a hold of me as well. So blessings to all of you. And Rena, I know we'll be talking, I imagine, this week. So yes, blessings to you, my friend. Thank you to you too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.